Hello and welcome back everybody. As you can see, we're finally on our way out of Hade and about to head on in and see what we can do on the unseen path to Hade. That connects it to No Man's Wharf. Grab the item that's back here. Beautiful monastery charm. And as you can see, I spent a lot of my souls and decided to head back to Majula to do all that. I increased my regular stats all the way up to a baseline, got enough faith to actually cast heal, though I <laughs> seem to have failed to attune it, and also, let's get out, oh, oh, I wanted to get three perfect rolls, but turns out it was too much to ask for, but I also managed to get my adaptability up just enough to grab my final, not final, but a few extra iframes, all the way up to 95, just in line with all those five agility breakpoints. And the last thing I did was upgrade the, not the, but Venhart's Parma, all the way up to plus three, was it? Yes. All the way up to plus three, in order to just get a little bit of extra physical defense out of it when I'm actually blocking with it, should I be choosing to. Roll, roll, and roll. There we go. Oh, he did go for the rare thrust attack follow-up, but I was not in line, so it completely whiffed for him, and I took him out in due course. Roll and roll. Bash and bash. Beautiful. There we go. There's only one more knight on the way out of Hade, and we're about to take him on in order to grab the elite knight set. Not the elite knight set, just the regular knight set that can be found in a chest above him, but in the meanwhile, we wait for this ladder to, not <laughs> the elevator, to take us down to the depths below. It's part of the wonky geometry of the world of Dark Souls 2. It kind of sucks that their world isn't nearly as continuous as Dark Souls 1 was, but it works out in the end. Just so long as you're not actually hearing about how the world is put together. It works just fine. The levels themselves feel really great. They're not, like, the best I've ever played, but they're still very good. I challenge anyone to say otherwise. And the DLCs go one further and actually make them some of the best I've ever played. Like, I think that they got progressively worse as they were released in terms of level design, but that's just from personal preference. I really liked Shulva's uh, lots of elevators, lots of different looking areas, and very varied um, elevation. I thought that the very centralized way that uh, the old Iron King DLC was laid out was kind of lackluster. I didn't think it really caught me as much as Shulva did, and Elaine Lois didn't do that vertical level design as well. It really kept it into just sort of pathways along a wall. It never felt like it was really tied in with itself, which is strange because it's actually one of the more tied in DLCs. Uh, it, it loops in on itself in some very clever ways, it just doesn't feel like it, and I think that's the real difficulty I have with enjoying it. Not to mention its challenge area, if you can call it that, was the most dreadful thing I've ever played in a Souls game, so I'm a little bit biased in that respect as well, but no matter. Here we are in No Man's Wharf trying to take out these little buggers, and the spear, while it should deal quite nice damage to most of these, like, cloth armored enemies, it is going to run into a problem in that its durability is only 50, and that's just not enough to clear through the No Man's Wharf. You're going to need something closer to 80 if you want to get through without using any repair powder. So I've got that to look forward to. Luckily, the Flexile Sentry is one of the easier bosses in the game. Especially if you can uh, keep one side facing you at all times just so you don't have to vary up your tactics. So I do have that going for me. It may be a tough level to clear through. But the boss itself shouldn't actually give me too much trouble. And, aside from that, it has a lot of great loot and item drops around the level that I can 
sate myself with as I am following through. Watch him jump down. It's just a cool little scene there. I, I really like little encounters like that where something special happens. It happened a lot in Bioshock, and I really appreciated it there, and I really appreciate it here in Dark Souls 2 when it happens. It doesn't come up quite as often as I might like, but it happens often enough that it's still enjoyable. One. Parry? No, I didn't get to parry. It is actually possible to parry these guys. <laughs> oh, come on! Bleeding. What are the odds? You know, despite the fact that the first two episodes I managed to get through completely deathless, I... I really think that that was kind of a fluke. This whole new perspective is really just throwing me through a ringer, and rightly so, and you know, I love it for it. I think that is exactly what I wanted from Dark Souls 2, a little, or at least to be added to Dark Souls 2, because believe me, Dark Souls 2 killed me its fair share of times when I went through my very first time, but then after a while I learned how to play it properly, and I got into the swing of things, and then dying became more and more rare until I became confident enough to start doing runs online for other people to watch and still be okay with whatever happened in the place. There we go. I need to keep using my shield. That is what I need to focus on. I just need to repeat to myself a few times throughout each level, don't forget to use your shield, because honestly, most of the times that I've died could have been saved if I'd have remembered to, that I had a shield equipped and that it had really decent physical block. In fact, I specifically picked it because of that fact, but have since decided to neglect that bit of reasoning and kind of just use it for parrying because it is a small shield and I'm a cocky son of a gun. Let's see. Bait him out. Let's try shielding. Much better. Can the... no... Oh! Oh, the strong attacks can keep him stunlocked. That is a useful discovery. That should help me take on the ones that I'm going to be finding later in the level. So, it's great that I managed to figure that out now, rather than later. All these Varangian fellows die quite nicely. In fact, some of them in one hit, which is absolutely beautiful. If you can take down an enemy in one hit, they're basically not a threat to you. Because you have the ability to unlock, kill that- oh, missed that. Missed it completely. Come on, where's the doorway? Where's the doorway? Where's the doorway? Ugh. I was str struggling so hard to kind of turn myself properly, but I thought that it was in the middle of the arch, not the extreme side of it, so I was doomed from the very beginning. There was no way I was going to find that doorway without actively looking for it. But let's stab our way on through nonetheless. We're at pretty good health. Our weapon durability is dropping as we knew it would, but we've cleared through the first area, and this next area shouldn't pose too much of an issue if I can... Oh, there we go. Keep these guys stunlocked, which is not a guarantee by any stretch of the imagination. What I really wish, beyond all things at this point, was that I had a tuned heal at the start of this area, because having it to kind of refresh midway through without wasting any of my Estus or Life Gems would be an absolute dream. That would be fantastic. Let's see if I can get... Oh, no. I was trying to see if I could get a backstab, but there we go. I mucked up the timing and tried to walk into the enemy, which is not going to have any favorable results. Walking into the enemy is always a bad idea, you know, unless you're... Uh, specifically using a very short-range weapon that needs you to walk into the enemy in order to hit properly. Namely, daggers and the such like. But, can I poke him through the doorway? I can. Can I get him stunned through the doorway? I can! That's gonna be a useful tactic here. Hopefully they don't break that down too quickly. Because I can just go to town. Well, so much for that idea. That's one of them down. If I can get a stagger hit on this guy, I can take him down without getting hit. 
which looks like it's going to be get flipped out. He did not stagger, and I rolled completely into the hit rather than through the hit, which is terrible, so that costs me another Estus, but he replaces it with a Radiant Life Gem, which is worth about twice as much as a single Estus charge in my opinion, so. Roll out. Bop. Bop. And bop. Oh, come off it. You were supposed to be dead. Just take your lumps. God. It's so frustrating because they're obstinate about it. It's like, you you kill them, or at least you attack them enough that they should be dead, and they just don't die. It's like, come on. Be a darling and just just fall over dead for me, would you please? Would you would you kindly even Oh gosh. <laughs> I even failed to dodge the crossbow bolts. Oh woe is me, I am doomed. Usually I can dodge those no problem, so. In order to compensate for my own inability to play the game properly because of my perspective, let's stock up on some cheese items that I'm going to be using later, just because they are probably going to become a necessity in order to get through certain areas where I would normally use them. And that black space and those textures, usually you wouldn't have this perspective and be looking at them. Usually the camera would be focused more on the ground than anything else, but I think it kind of demonstrates how much game designers skimp on the extra details in order to make sure that what you see still looks good because you never see textures like that anywhere what that you're actively looking for them like anywhere where that you would have your camera normally and be expecting to have nice textures you know outside of the whatchamacallit um earthen peak which is just dreadfully colored and it, it really is inexcusable. They should have known that people would at least look up and see the ceiling there, and they didn't take it, that into account, and they designed an ugly ceiling, and the game suffers for it because that area just looks ugly as all get-go. Double kill. And, hopefully, I can demonstrate exactly how useful these spears are with this next enemy after I grab this flash shard. Huh? This crystal lizard? Not going to be a problem, because if you're locked on with a spear, the spear actually will home downward slightly, and the tracking manages to allow you to pick up the Crystal Lizards 9 times out of 10. It's a really great uh, tactic for taking Crystal Lizards on, and it's probably going to be a heap more successful than trying to actively snipe them with anything realistic such as firebombs or, like, a mace. Things along that ilk that kind of take a more targeted eye in order to take on. But no matter, we looted that place, so let's come through here and open this up. Thank you. For some reason it didn't want to give it to me. I can loot both these chests. And, you know, considering that there's nothing back there that I'm really gonna want. I think that I can just ignore the shortcut, at least once I've unlocked it, because none of the loot in that area is going to be useful on this character, and head right onto the boss after a quick repair powder. So I think that's what I'm gonna do. You all have fun there. I know you're gonna miss the chance to kill me, but I'm not gonna miss the chance to die, so. Thank you very much. I'm taking my services elsewhere. Roll right on down this little area so that I take no fall damage and don't have to deal with the two monsters in the area behind me. I can poke him off the edge, wait for his friend to come on up, and I can poke him off the edge as well. And I considered boosting my intelligence before coming here, but honestly, Carillion is one of the most worthless vendors because almost none of his spells are really worth anything. And uh, his only other ability is to upgrade your Pyromancy Flame, which by the time you have a Pyromancy Flame, you can probably be using Rosabeth to upgrade it. So he's, he's generally pretty useless. All he is is a waste of time and a pompous face who can sell you quite a number of really low-level spells, but nothing really good. Oh, I got an item. The Sibo! That's interesting, but 
not actually useful since I am running a dex character for once, and dex characters are much better off with any number of other bows, but the sea bow is not among them. The sea bow is good for quality characters or even strength characters who want a sniping bow because the generic uh, strength bow is going to be the dragon rider bow which has extremely low range and the other one that scales C off of strength would be the there we go the repair powder would be the uh, composite bow or bell keeper bow which is honestly more of a dex bow than anything but the composite bow which also has dreadful range so one of the only real options for strength characters who want to be sniping at all or just using arrows at range is going to be the sea bow even though it has pretty high stamina costs for a bow and pretty long reload times that make it suboptimal for anybody else to use it has its niche as with most weapons Admittedly, some weapons are just complete joke weapons and don't have a niche really anywhere, but those weapons, I would say, are few and far between, and that's part of the beauty of the balance of Dark Souls 2. What's great about this guy is that he doesn't require a lot of circling around in order to manipulate him and face him. Most of his attacks just come straight forward, which means that I don't have to be constantly turning the camera, which is the hardest part about managing your character in this mod. Is turning the camera to face new foes. Whenever you have a large number of enemies coming at you, or enemies that you need to circle around in order to fight effectively, you're going to have a really bad time because of how slow the camera is to move and how imprecise it is to home in quickly. That's what's so great about having the third person camera and the ability to lock on, which locks your camera onto a certain foe is that it really just facilitates combat, the way Dark Souls is designed. Knocking that bell a bunch, and we're about to head out to the side passage, the exile chambers, over in the Lost Bastille, and gonna completely skip out on the Ruined Sentinels, just because I don't want to fight them on this character. I do not want to fight them in first person. And I don't have to, so good day to them. If you'll bear with me for long enough, I'd like to make it to the next bonfire. I think that might set me a little bit over time, looking at the clock here, but I'm not quite sure. But it shouldn't be too bad, so just bear with me. As we head up, I, I just want to say that this, this mod... This mod... <laughs> I almost forgot that I passed through a loading screen just because of how easy it is to, for me to slip into that third person view. It's easy as pie just because of that, that's how I'm used to playing Dark Souls. That is Dark Souls for me in my experience. That is how I'm used to playing it and that is the prototypical way that I'm going to view it and expect it to be presented to me so kind of missed out on that but this mod has really really been giving me a tough time and I know I've said it before but I'm saying it again just because of how completely true it is. It's a very difficult mod to get used to, and I'm still not quite gotten the hang of it. There are still a variety of enemies and bosses that are going to give me quite the trouble because of how circular and mobile you have to be while fighting them. Generally speaking, kiting backwards is a poor way to take on most combat situations, and probably gonna get you killed and that's what I'm gonna probably be forced into so hopefully I don't get killed this is gonna be where I cut the episode as I come up and tag this bonfire so thank you so much for watching I'm having a wonderful time with this mod it's really changing up the game for me and I really want to thank you all for following along so thank you so much for watching and you all have a nice day